Hello, my name is Dr. Katrina Cornish and I'll be talking to you today about rubber production in the, in the world today. 42% of all the rubber we use is natural rubber, which means that it comes from plants. The rest comes from petroleum, which is a non-sustainable version, uh, non version of rubber. Now, where does our natural rubber come from? At the moment, it all comes from the tropical rubber tree. And where is that? Well, it originated in the Amazon. This is the Brazilian rubber tree, but hardly any rubber comes from there now, maybe about 3%. And this is because of fatal fungal diseases. And we're very worried in the world that these diseases might spread to the other rubber producing areas. Now, Africa has a fair amount of rubber, but it's not produced very efficiently, and they only contribute about 5% of the supply. So really, the area we care about is Asia. 92% of all the rubber comes from Southeast Asia. These are countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, and now China is becoming a significant producer. But you need a tropical region. Now, if we look in the Northern Hemisphere, we look at North America, which includes us, Europe, which includes my folks, there's no rubber. All of this has to be imported. And between Ohio, where we are now, and Malaysia, this is a 12 hour time difference. So this all gets put on a boat and brought all the way over here. So this is not a very good scenario. Also, as these countries are rapidly developing, you're looking at Brazil, Africa as a continent, India, China, these people all want more rubber because rubber is ubiquitous in modern life. 70% goes to tires. So we in the US import 1.2 million metric tons a year. The shortfalls projected for just a few years ahead are greater than the entire amount that we import. So where are we going to get our rubber from? This is a picture of a plantation of the Havea rubber tree. This is grown a few feet apart as clones on seedling rootstocks. So for as far as the eye can see, for miles and miles and miles, it's genetically identical material. This means it's extremely prone to crop failure. They struggle with fungal diseases all the time. And if the South American leaf blight makes it to Southeast Asia, we could lose our entire production in one or two years. Now, as I said, modern life is dependent. And this is largely because of high performance properties that natural rubber has. The higher the performance of a tire, the greater the percentage of natural rubber. An airplane tire is 100% natural rubber. It can't land if there's any synthetic in there without blowing up. A regular car tire is about 50%. The trucks you see are 90 to 100% natural, and the big earth moving tires, tractor tires, they're 100% natural. You can't make it, can't make those materials with something that from synthetics. Now, it is of course essential to the economy and national defense. You can't have a war without natural rubber. Even a tank has half a ton in it. Um, and as I say, 1.2 million. This is a $50 billion industry in the US. The global industry is about $200 billion. There is a cartel, so maybe they'll get their act together one day and have a proper OREC equivalent. Um, and as I said, automotive and tires. Now, this tree is tapped by hand this enormous market, and this is how it's done. Literally, you have rubber tappers like this. This one's got a lamp in his hat. They go out in the pre-dawn hours and tap when the latex yields are greatest. And they collect through this tapping panel this rubber latex in a little cup. This is a better picture of it dripping into these cups. And then this poor guy goes down, tips the cups into his buckets, and he walks down to the tree line and then puts them into something larger. And it's then taken to a manufacturing plant that either dewaters it to make concentrate, which will go to the latex dipping industry, or it's coagulated in one of various methods. And that's what you tend to make things like tires out of. Now, how much is this really? So we have 12 million metric tons globally of natural rubber and we have 1.2 coming into the states. So I calculated this out in grown male African elephant equivalents. So you get some concept of what this actually is. So at the moment, the global supply is about 11 of these a minute tapped in that little cup. You're collected in that little cup by hand. Now by 2030, we're supposed to have a tripling, nearly a tripling in demand 
and that's 28 elephants a minute. Now the immediate need that we already know in six years, and it takes six or seven years to, for a tree to become tappable, we have to destroy nearly 33,000 square miles of rainforest for new plantings. And this is to meet 2022 demand. Now this acreage is the size of South Carolina or Austria. And this is cutting down rainforest in one of the few areas of biodiversity that we have left to us. So this is clearly an unacceptable scenario. The World Wildlife Fund has, has support, is supporting a moratorium on new Havea plantations. Now, also, if we start in the bioeconomy moving towards replacing synthetic rubber with natural rubber through chemical modifications and things of this nature, this could double again. And this could end up being an African elephant a second tapped into that little cup and with massive ecological destruction going with that. So alternatives are essential. We have to make our rubber from something else as well. And this is Wayuli, which is a desert shrub from the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico and Texas. And this is the dandelion. Now, this is a semi-arid shrub. It makes beautiful rubber, beautiful latex, but we're in Ohio. Ohio has a lot of rain. This guy does not like a lot of rain. But this one comes from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. It likes the snow, it likes the rain. We can grow this in Ohio. So it's, this is the one that we're developing as a crop in this state. Now there's 50,000 different products made with natural rubber from tires, balloons, tubing, there's just a very few of them being shown here. This little guy is an artist balloon, animal balloon, and uh, that is the first actual animal balloon ever made from Wayuli latex in the history of the world. Now if you're going to actually accomplish making a new crop it's very complicated. This is, you have to have coordination from plant to product to do this. If you're going to make a new product out of something like corn, you can just call up a train load. You know, it's already there, the same for soybeans. But if you want to make something out of a new rubber from alternate crop, you've got to grow it first. So we've got a big program in germplasm improvement you have to also be able to grow it in the field. Weed control and irrigation are the biggies here. We need to have farmers, growers, who are actually going to grow it. There's only so much you can put on, a, on an experiment farm. And you have to, how are you going to look after it post-harvest? What is the logistics of getting it from the field to the process? So here you need to have a robust process. We're emphasizing 100% crop production, valorizing every piece, and then you have the factory. This post harvest has to be delivered to the factory, processed here. This can produce then latex and rubber and also the gas, the rest of the plant. So what are you going to do with that? And then what are your co-products? How can you valorize this to have your co-products? Your latex and rubber. Rubber is not the same. There's 2,500 plants we know make it. They all have differences in their composition, differences in the macromolecular structure. So the same compounding recipe isn't going to give you the same result in every different species of rubber that you might extract. Most of them are not high quality. So you have to develop all of that process so you can make high quality products. Down here, we've got products and fuels from the co-product materials. Then these have to be marketed and sale. We have, you have to have customers. And then only then can you do expansion. Now, if we're looking at tires, how many acres would you need to be meaningful to introduce a new tire line? Well, hundreds of thousands at least. And then where's your processing plants for producing hundreds of thousands of uh, extracting hundreds of thousands of tires? So you have to have something. What are you going to do with 10 acres? What are you going to do with 100 acres? What is this rubber going to go, go toward? Because if you don't scale processing, sales, and production together, uh, this, just, this does not succeed. However, it is a nice plant. It's ecologically uh, benign. We have a very happy bee on one of our dandelions. This is at our experimental farm here. And then we could do it by transplants. This is before the polar vortex winter. You see, half of the plants did survive. This is the seed crop the following year. 
This, though, was the direct seeded crop on a commercial farm last year. And then down here, the big problem, as I say, is weeds. If you don't weed, this is what you end up with. No dandelions and just lots of weeds because they swamp, the, they swamp this new crop, which isn't vigorous enough to compete against them. So the big challenge is how do you kill the dandelions without killing the dandelions? All right, so now that we've gone through this background of what our main issues are to establish a domestic rubber crop in the US, the rest of the class is going to be walking you through parts of that jigsaw I showed a couple of slides ago, showing you examples of how you actually, where rubber comes from in this plant, how you quantify it and how you then turn it into uh, rubber products. Now this is our tissue culture lab. Yeah. And it, tissue culture is when you take pieces of a plant under sterile conditions and do interesting things to it, either shoot proliferation, make a lot more plants, is a common technique in the nursery industry, or you can do CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, which is a targeted mutagenesis, changing the genes that the plant, that the plant already has, or you can do genetic modification, which means introducing genes that you want the plant to have, but which it doesn't. And there's three basic methods that we use here. Uh, one is the classical transform your leaf disc, and that's with agrobacterium tumor facients. Another one is the gene gun, where you shoot genes into your tissue. And in our project with chloroplast engineering, that's what we have to use. It's the only way to do that type of, uh, type of method. And then our very exciting one is our root transformation method, because this is very, very quick. We're, we're able to go from a root transformation to a plant with seed in only about 150 days. So it's extremely quick. Uh, in many cases, this would take a year. And most species won't let you do root transformation because the tops they put on are not transgenic or not edited. This is an exception. So if you, the other thing, as I say, is root proliferation and shoot proliferation, making a lot of plants clonely. And as you saw in the greenhouse, we could do it with root clones, but we can actually make a lot more under these conditions. So I'm just going to go through a series so you can see what the sort of thing that we do. So first, we would have some sterile seed and we would grow sterile plants. So here's a nice set of sterile plants. There's shoots on them and there's roots on them. Now we take those roots off under sterile conditions and spit them out and put them into a new media. You don't need hormones for this. And you see these pieces of root have already started to put shoots on. And those shoots will be genetic copies of their roots. Now at that point, we would then grow those up and you might end up with something like this, where we now have a lot of shoots. Now this is getting a bit crowded. So you make a decision at this point, do I want more of these or do I want to put these in the greenhouse? But in this case, I'm gonna say, we want more, we don't have enough. So this box would get split between multiple boxes uh, for proliferation. So we take those and you, those would get converted to many boxes containing something like this, where there's just a very few plants. Now these are gonna grow up again and fill the box. And then we end up with this box. Again, lots of shoots. Now I'm gonna say at this point, these are ready to go out to the greenhouse. But this, these have spent all their lives in 100% humidity, except when they were being subcultured. So if I just plant these out, they're going to die of transplant shock. So instead, we'll subculture these into peat pellets. And then this is a peat pellet, and you can see the plants are doing pretty well. And so this one is about ready to get ready to go to the greenhouse. And what you first do is crack the lid to lower the humidity. You're not doing anything else and we can then, after a few days with the cracked lid, then it'll be ready to go into a greenhouse situation. And this one here, you can see this lid is cracked open and this, this plant will be potted up in the next week or so. Now, as you saw in the greenhouse, if you have a lot of dead leaves, this one's got quite a few dead leaves, this is bad for the plant. And if it's in the tissue culture, it doesn't matter so much in the peat pot, it could end up killing the plant that you want 
So what we're doing over here, uh, Nikki is in the sterile laminar flow hood, which keeps all of the air in front of her sterile with no fungus or bacterial spores. She is cleaning up a tissue culture with dead leaves, which are basically becoming toxic to the culture, to the healthy leaves. And then once that is done, she will subculture the healthy plants into separate little plantlets in the new media, in the new sterile magenta box. Okay, now here in this processing plant is where we take out the rubber from the roots, which we then would want to make into things. So this is a bag of roots harvested from the field. Now, some roots don't have very much rubber in them. I'm just gonna check this one. It breaks very cleanly. So that's a low rubber root. Let's try another one. And in this one, you can see here, it's still attached by the rubber in the, in the plant. So we can break this up in different places. And you can see it, it breaks, but it's still held together by the rubber. So this is what we're after, plants, roots that look like this, that pass this break test, as we call it, and do not immediately break. And now what we then do with these is we put them in this piece of equipment, which is a chopper and crusher. This is to increase the surface area of the different pieces of roots. So here we would take our roots like this, flatten them and chop them up to make them easier to extract. Now once that is done, they come out of this piece of equipment and they go into this one. So here we weigh the amount of roots and they go up the bucket elevator and then go into this PLC controlled hot water inulin countercurrent extractor. Now what this does is extract the inulin from these roots. This is high molecular weight polyfructose and it interferes with rubber extraction. The PLC is behind these tanks and it's controlled by computers. So they're loaded up and the plumbing allows up to 12 countercurrent extractions, which means with each extraction, the inulin syrup becomes uh, more concentrated and more concentrated. The final syrup is actually pumped across the ceiling to a large stainless steel storage tank at the end of this processing plant. Now the roots will get dropped onto the conveyor belt once their inulin is gone. And they're now looking like a, a mulch with rubber in it. So they come down this conveyor and are dropped into a big container and are then taken up to either the large hammer mill in the back there, a pebble mill I mean, pebble mill in the back there, or these airlift enzyme reactors. So this allows us to do all sorts of combinations of extraction treatments to get our best possible rubber yield. Now, once we have our rubber and root skin separated, they will come back to the a separator that is behind us here. Okay, so our mixture of separated root skins and rubber then go into this two-stage flotation separator, which floats the rubber while the gas and root skin sink. We repeat this with an identical piece of equipment here. After this, we collect it all and wash it some more in a screener washer. And we also recover the water used for recycling at this step. Now the rubber is then scraped off the top and it looks a bit like gray boiled rice. That material is then dumped into this small auger, which is a dewatering auger. And the idea is that this will squeeze some of the water out so there'd be less to dry. So this sort of squeezed boiled rice sort of mixture then goes to the oven across the way and is then dried in trays uh, to remove the rest of the water. At that point, we can put all that rubber together and squeeze it into blocks that can be distributed using our heated rubber press. So the same piece of equipment that we would use to make a testing sample, we can use to make our raw rubber samples for distribution.
This is one of the rubber containing roots from the rubber dandelion that we're trying to turn into a crop for the United States, uh, starting in Ohio. The rubber is contained in these long roots. We've already trimmed some of the top off. Now what we do, we need to know how much rubber is in here because this is basically a wild species under very rapid accelerated crop domestication. So one thing we want to have is high yielding plants that we can interbreed. The fastest way to do this is using near infrared spectroradiometry, which is this machine here. And this allows us to do high throughput rapid rubber quantification in ground root material. So this is our rubber containing root. So we dry this and grind it up so it's nice and evenly and finely ground and then this machine will allow us to measure how much rubber it has. So this goes onto this light here. This light shines into the sample and is reflected back but not all the wavelengths are reflected back because the rubber has absorbed some of them and we can then determine how much rubber there was. Pour it into that sample holder, make sure there's no gaps because if the light shines directly through that won't, uh, won't work. Position that directly over the lamp and then take, take its picture in effect. We're taking a scan. You can see the green line moves across. Here is the new spectrum. Now what we will do, do you want to say what happens next? Sure. Once I take three scans of each sample, those scans will be um, averaged and that average scan will be put through the chemometric software where we will be able to output our rubber value for the sample. And the really nice thing about this machine is it is also mobile and we can take it out in the field. The spectrophotometer goes into a backpack and this goes on a tray in front of the operator. Now this method that we've just been showing you cannot tell the difference between more than one type of rubber. This measures total rubber. Now in the plant though, all rubber begins in the form of microscopic rubber particles in the cytoplasm of cells. However, as the root grows, many of those rubber particles will stick to each other and turn into solid rubber form. But the NIR can't tell the difference. The next method that I'm going to show you is actually how we quantify how much of the rubber is still in the form of latex and can be used to make things like gloves. Now the method we just saw, the NIR, Near Infrared Spectroradiometry, measures all of the rubber in a root. However, in the plant, when the rubber starts to be made, it's made in individual rubber particles, which form at that microscopic level a emulsion, an emulsion like a heavy cream. And I have a bottle of some here that we've made. So in the root, however, this rubber can also be turned into solid rubber while, you are, while the plant is still alive. The NIR can't tell the difference. So the measurement we get there is both of these together. However, we do have a quantification method that allows us to measure the fraction that is in this form. And this is what Akbar is doing over here. So we take this fresh root, can't do it with dry because all the latex will turn into solid rubber with dry, and he chops it up and then homogenizes it. So you're making a little root milkshake. Then we centrifuge it, which floats the rubber particles like cream from milk. And then we can coagulate that floated rubber into a solid, sort of like a cheese, then we could just peel it off the top of our little tube and dry it and weigh it. And that tells us what percentage of the rubber was in the form of latex in the root. So now that the centrifugation run has finished, all our latex particles, which are lighter than water, should have floated to the top. As you can see here, we have solids in the bottom, a clear layer in between, and latex rubber floating on the top. Now this rubber we now want to quantify. So we can't take it off like that. So what we actually do is add a drop of acid, acetic acid, and then recentrifuge it, which turns it into a little coagulated pad. We then take that off with forceps and put it on a weigh boat and dry it. And what it looks like then is, is this. And these can be weighed and it's, it's in triplicate so we can get some very good confidence about how much latex rubber did those roots have. We would then take the gas, if you could pass me a sample of the gas, which looks like this, we would regrind this and then use solvents to measure how much rubber was in those roots that was not in the form of latex at point of harvest. Then these two together add up to total rubber. It's a, there's a small fraction in there. 
And that total rubber is analogous to the total rubber we measured with the near-infrared, or the NIR. This is an accelerated solvent extractor, unfortunately not currently operational. But this uses different solvents to extract different things. Uh, so we can measure the amount of, of carbohydrate in our roots. We can measure the amount of rubber in our roots, gravimetrically, that's weighing, with this piece of equipment. Now, some of our gene-edited plants are where we've said, try and make less inulin and try and make more rubber. This can quite quickly tell us how. It's much less fast than the near-infrared, near though. Now, as we've discussed, rubber comes in two forms before manufacturing, solid rubber and latex rubber. And in this instance, we're going to show latex dipping. Now, in latex dipping, you use the same sorts of ingredients that you do with solid rubber. You still need compound ingredients. You need antioxidants, accelerators, cross-linkers. But in this case, the, the product isn't molded. It isn't molded by compression and heat like in the oven. It's dipped and it takes on the shape of whatever you dip into it. So this is a surgical glove former. When you dip that into the latex and bring it back out, it will be covered in the latex and we then turn that into a glove. This is a children's balloon. So you could put large numbers of these on a plate. We, we actually could do four of these at a time, only just one glove at a time. And then this is a condom former. So we can put uh, four of these, make four condoms at a time as well. Now to build up the proper film, a glove, which is a fairly thick product, first has the plate or the former coated with a coagulant. We've already done that here. And we're going to dip on a plate instead of a glove former because that allows us to do a lot of different tensile tests when we're developing a new compound for a new product. And Jin Yu is going to now show us this process. Here the plate is going down into a latex tank. And it goes into the latex and sits there for a predetermined length of time. Then it will slowly come out. Here it's coming out and you can see the plate is coated with a big lump. <laughs> anyway, the plate is coated and now this plate is going to be rotated in all, di all directions to try and make a smooth, non-dripped, non-drippy um, finished product. Then we can use the same types of dumbbells that we use with solid rubber to make test pieces. And they also go onto the Instron. Now this particular sample is a bit lumpy. It's because while we were doing this, we actually had some coagulation in the tank. But normally we would filter that right at the beginning and then these lumps wouldn't be there. After this film has set up, it would go into a curing oven. So that would be baked for a little bit. Then it could come back out and have a polymer coating, for example, or be leached uh, in that less than finished stage. It would then go back into the oven to be completely cured, and then it would be as strong as the glove you get out of your box. Now, when we've got our rubber made, we now need to make it into a rubber product. So what we have here is some raw rubber. This is actually from the tropical rubber tree. This one's from a different alternative source. And we have some other rubber that's over here. Now, this, you can see, is very tough looking rubber. We have to mix it. So this is like part of the dough in your kitchen. We have to stir this up. But how can you stir something that's this tough? Well, the first thing is you have to cut it up into small pieces and then you mix in your ingredients, which should be your sulfur for cross-linking, accelerators, antioxidants, processing oils, things like that. And your filler is key to making a reinforced material. Now, this is carbon black. So this is the one made from petroleum by spraying and drying. It's a spray dry process. And this is what makes all rubber things black. Rubber is not black. Carbon is black. This is why people think that rubber is black. Okay? Now, we've in our group 
done some very interesting things. This is a filler that you could do a 50% replacement of carbon black with ground up tomato peels, some processing tomatoes. And they've been bred so that the one in the bottom of the truck doesn't get squashed by 500 sitting on its head. So it's very tough material, just what you want in a filler. And then our most successful filler is this material. This is actually micro-sized eggshells, which are produced in enormous quantity. We actually use 94 billion eggs a year in the US, and half of them at least are produced at food processing plants. It's a very accessible material. So then what we do, we cut it up, and Tony will show you how we have to cut this material up. These bales of rubber come in 75 pound lumps, which are very heavy. So this one's already had its end cut off, but we use this same thing, whatever size of bale, and so they fit in here. And this is how you cut it. And then we would turn it the other way and cut it up into small chunks. Now Tony has already cut up some waste rubber into small pieces for this demonstration. And he's gonna feed those waste rubber into the rubber mixer. And it also add all sorts of compounding ingredients in a particular order. And there's a big tamper that comes on this that pushes that rubber into the mixing bowl that's at the bottom of this. Now, you saw how hard that rubber was. It takes a tremendous amount of power to mix these ingredients uniformly into the rubber mixture. So this is high shear and high heat. So this is uh, a lot of hard work. Now, we also have power capture software. So this is being pumped out of this machine and we can tell how much power is needed at any stage of this process to mix this material. So this is what these traces are. This allows us to say, does, do eggshells reduce or increase power? Or do our tomato peels, do they increase or reduce power? We're actually finding that using bio-based fillers as a partial component of the total filler does actually reduce the power. The cost of electricity to power these machines is one of the major costs in a tire factory. So they're very interested in power reduction. Now this batch is almost finished. As we can see, this red line is very flat. This means there's no fluctuations in the power required to keep this blend homogeneous. And this means this is ready, ready for discharge. So Tony is now going to discharge this batch of rubber and it will come out of the machine and will, we will then mill it. Now Cindy has taken the rubber that came out of the mixer and is now putting it on the rubber mill. So this is like going from your mixing bowl to your rolling pin. And so she is going to thoroughly mix and blend and roll out the rubber. This is what is done in the big tire factories, for example. You'll see this on a much larger scale. As you can see through the top, there's what's called a dam. As the rubber is mixing and above the juncture between the two rollers. And that you can see that the rubber is really mixing very well. Then she'll take it off the rollers and fold it back up again and refeed it. And there's a particular protocol of how many times and in what manner you do this to meet ASTM specifications. When this is finished, she'll pull the whole thing out, keeping track of which direction the roll was in. Then a small piece will be cut out and will be put into the heated press. Now the next stage is to cure the rubber, make a finished rubber piece. So Cindy cut out a small piece of rubber and put it into that stainless steel ASTM specified mold. This goes into the oven. This is a heated press. We put 15 tons of pressure on it, 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees centigrade. And we now cook that for about 15 minutes. Right, now this cycle is almost finished. So our rubber is almost completely cooked. When we reach the end of the preset cook time, the press will stop and open all by itself. So your oven door is automatic in this instance. So now Cindy will get, bring this over and open up the, the cookie sheet, as you like, this, the mold, and take out the sample. This is now a finished piece of rubber. 
we would normally wait at least 24 hours before testing the tensile strength of this. So, natural rubber is an extremely important material in the modern world. It was recently said that life as we know it would not be recognizable if we hadn't developed rubber. And this has only been with us for a little over 100 years. It's absolutely amazing. Now, it has also been pointed out that, our fourth, that rubber is our fourth most important natural resource after air, water, and petroleum. Now, this is just a staggering uh, notice of how important it is today. So I want you to imagine millions of acres of rubber dandelions spread across the northern US. And as you drive down the interstates, those large processing plants that you see looming up will no longer be ethanol. They will be rubber extraction plants for this crop. And we will have hundreds of thousands of new jobs and we can not only become self-sustainable in natural rubber, we can become a rubber exporting country and be sending rubber back to other countries who can't produce it for themselves or at least produce enough for themselves. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it.